Okay. Uh, you're going to hear a similar message from me. Uh, you'll, you'll see some of the same uh, ideas, uh, but I'm going to take this from a different direction. I am primarily personally interested in uh, the display, or let us say the, dis the intersection of the display, the optics, and human perception, human vision science. Uh, and so this is a call to action, much like you just heard. Um, you know, I work at NVIDIA, we make graphics hardware, we power all of these, not all of these, we power many of these uh, virtual reality and augmented reality experiences. Um, uh, nobody's actually said this, you know, if, you, if you've wondered why the industry is so excited about why, um, about, you know, about VR and AR and why people are pouring so much money into it, it's, it's I, I sort of summarize it this way, is that VR could re replace all of the screens in your life, um, uh, except the smartphone, and AR could replace that, right? So those are enormous financial um, promises kind of hanging out there for the company, companies, the, the ecosystem and industry that, that can grab hold of that. But it poses all kinds of incredible challenges, and I'm gonna focus again on, on the ones, uh, the sort of the visual side of these challenges, specifically on, on the display. Um, the first problem, of course, is simply that you've got to near eye display. You've got to wear something this so close to your eye that you know an adult human can't focus on it at all. So how do you how do you put something close to the eye? Period. Um, uh, the field of view is a big challenge. Uh, you heard Meta talk about how you know the 90 degree field of view is one of the differentiating factors uh, that they have. It's it's a real challenge to get a very wide field of view. But of course, human field of view is much greater than that. Binocular field of view. You know, depending on how you measure it, two, 220 degrees is a reasonable estimate, I would claim. Um, size, most, uh, most virtual, and virtual reality and augmented reality headsets are somewhere between sort of scuba goggles and, um, and ski goggles. They're, they're pretty large. Uh, and that turns out to be just the fundamental problem that if you have a convex lens focusing on a panel, you need a certain, and it's wide field of view, so that, that lens has to have a large aperture, then the panel has to be you know, a certain distance away. It has to be at, at or near the focal length of that lens. Um, latency is a big problem. This has been alluded to a couple of times. You need to redraw that image very, very quickly um, in order for people not to get sick, right? So that people, in, in fact, in the, one, in the one study, I was thinking, oh my gosh, like if I move my head and then, then the world moves, I, I bet people barfed in that study. I'm, I'm just curi curious to hear. Um, uh, and you need, of course, very high resolution. If you put on any of the virtual reality experiences today, they're all disappointing in terms of resolution. You can see the pixels, you can see the, the, the little sub-pixels, you can see the lines between the little sub-pixels. Um, uh, we need much better resolution to approach the capabilities of the human visual system. Um, and focus cues have been alluded to. You've heard a lot about uh, accommodation convergence conflict. Uh, I think this is actually a huge problem, uh, that, and I'm gonna focus a lot of my talk, if you will, on that, on that topic. And of course, power. I won't go into this, but we'd also like to do this in a battery-powered fashion that where it can last at least all day and be lightweight, and not have to be lugging around a giant battery. Uh, whereas today, most of these experiences are plugged into a thousand-watt PC. Um, augmented reality doubles down on all of these problems. You've got the same set of problems. Furthermore, you've got a brightness problem. You've got to be able to compete with sunlight but look good in, in you know, moonlight. Um, uh, you've got an attenuation problem. You can't attenuate the real world too much, or for example, it won't be legal to drive with it. Um, uh, occlusion was alluded to. Occlusion is a very, very hard problem if you want these synthetic, dark synthetic objects to occlude re, you know, bright real objects. There's light emitting diodes, there's no dark emitting diodes, so, so we, nobody knows quite how to solve that problem. Um, and latency, as was just mentioned, is much more rigorous of a requirement. Uh, to give, put some numbers behind this, latency needs to be about nine milliseconds or better for good augmented reality, for the objects to appear fixed and stuck to the, to the, to the real world. You can probably get away with closer to 20 milliseconds in virtual reality, although in both cases, you wish it was one millisecond. You'd really like to push that down. Um, I'm gonna just allude to three of these topics, and I'm gonna go through the first extremely quickly. Um, I don't really need to convince you that size is a problem for all of these various systems that we've developed for stereoscopic viewing over the years. Um, one, one thing you can do is you can compromise on field of view, and they figure this out for the view master. So this is actually, by today's standards, not a bad form factor. Uh, it's, a, it's maybe four centimeters, five centimeters, not too bad. Ivan Sutherland's groundbreaking display in 1968. This is the first actual VR headset. Um, it looks compact, but it's just because they folded the optics and they're behind his head like handlebars. Um, uh, the Sony PlayStation VR, the Oculus Rift. Again, we've got that scuba goggles kind of, kind of um, form factor. And why is it so large? It's what I said before. You want a, a lens of a certain size for big field of view. You need the thing to be 
a certain distance, the screen to be a certain distance away. And there's no getting around that with clever optics, uh, at least of this kind of conventional model. But hold that thought, because now, now what I want to do, and, and this is all by way of kind of showing you projects that we've done over the years to sort of inspire you as to the, the opportunities for vision science to come in and, and help us build revolutionary displays that will sort of attain this promise that we're so excited about. Um, let me, let me introduce this concept of a light field display. The idea is that we're going to control all the spatial and angular rays that enter the pupil, and we're going to do that in order to support focus cues. And of course, in the real world, essentially from any point, there's a cone of light rays entering the aperture of the eye. Um, so the basic idea of a light field display is that if we had a display that not only could control the color spatially, it could control the color of each pixel, but it could also control the direction, the directional color of each pixel then you could simply recreate all of those rays. If you, could, if you had a dense enough sampling of, of, of the spatial and angular space uh, domain, then you could recreate the effect of looking at an object at a certain focus depth. Um, and so what we're doing is replacing a two-dimensional image display with a four-dimensional light field display, where the dimensions are spatial and angular. Um, and this works. And let me show you an example of this. This is several years ago. This is from 2013, work that we did in my lab. Uh, basically, what we did is we replaced the single big lens, big convex lens in front of the display with a micro lens array. Each of these, whoops, sorry, each of these lenses is one millimeter across. That means it has a four millimeter focal length, which means the entire optical stack of this thing is about half a centimeter, it's like five millimeters thick. So we're also solving the size and weight problems along the way, by the way, you know, with this. Um, and what you can see is that if I shove the camera right up to this, well past the place where the quarter, for example, on the table gets blurry, um, I can see a crisp in focus image, right? What's going on there? Uh, just, just to emphasize again, this thing is the display. Oh, you can't see it there, sorry. Uh, this thing is the display. This thing, the stuff above it is, is not part of the display. That's just some electronics. Um, so what's going on here is that underneath that microlens array, we're displaying a whole bunch of little elemental images. And they're all refracting out to the microlenses, combining. So essentially, every pixel on the display is corresponding to a ray of light coming from some position in some, at some angle. And so again, we're able to recreate the effect of a image uh, at, a very, at various focal depths. In fact, it's, it's variable. For example, if you were to focus, I can't do this with a camera here, but if you were to focus on the, the headlight of the car, uh, then the back of the car gets blurrier and so forth. But you'll also notice that even though this image is clearly in focus, it's also quite blurry. It's low resolution, in fact. Right? And that's, that's the real Achilles heel of this approach. This is the, um, this is the perfect VR display. It is uh, the holy grail. It is thin, as I mentioned. It, therefore, it's lightweight. There's not, our, our display is only 40 degree field of view, but there's nothing about this design that prevents you from, from getting wider. Um, uh, so it supports wide field of view. And it's comfortable. And three things, it provides focus cues. Okay, so it's, you know, that solves the virgin's accommodation conflict. Uh, it presents more natural imagery. And hearkening back to um, Emily's talk, the, uh, what are eyeglasses? Eyeglasses are devices for bending the rays of light as they enter your eyes. We are controlling the rays of light that enter your eye. We can take your eyeglass prescription and bake it directly into the light field that we display into your eyes. And so this, I think, solves this very important problem, which, which you've heard raised, of you know, how do we support people with different prescriptions? How do we support presbyopes? How do we support myopes? Um, but you know, the reason why we're not selling this <laughs> is that you sacrifice a lot of spatial resolution. I'm trading off all of those pixels uh, that I was using for spatial resolution. Now I'm getting angular resolution with them. And so in practice, you're losing a factor of, say, 6 in X and 6 in Y, so like 36X, fewer pixel, effective pixel count. So I, this is not a product. It's not going to be a product anytime soon. However, I think this might be interesting to this community. This is not hard to build. Right, these diffusers are a few bucks. You know, they're stamped out of plastic. You know, you slap it down on a high-resolution cell phone screen, or an even higher-resolution OLED micro display. Not very expensive to build, and all of a sudden you've got this very flexible light field display. I think this could be interesting. It's a discretization of the wavefront uh, without going all the way down to holography. So I think this is an interesting tool for people who maybe haven't considered it. Um, let's go. Let's do something a little simpler. Um, so the meta display, as you see, is basically a curved mirror reflecting a display that's kind of up here in your brow. What if we made that mirror dynamically deformable? And so now this, this gets to another design of, of what Emily uh, alluded to, which is uh, very focal displays, right? So this idea that we can, con we can design many different optical stacks that will focus at different distances. Um, here's our sort of conceptual idea here. This is a see-through membrane. Um, that is deformable, and we basically have a pressure chamber behind it, and so you basically suck on that a little bit, create a little bit of a vacuum, it sort of deforms into that and changes its magnification. This actually works, it works surprisingly well. This, this paper was some colleagues at UNC who got a best paper award at IEEE VR last year. Um, 
and so you can, you, can accom you can focus at different depths. You still have this problem that now whatever you're looking at is in focus, assuming you use eye tracking, but everything you're not looking at is also in focus. And so you have to simulate the retinal blur. And how to do that and how to do that well is one of the really interesting problems that people are tackling both you know, in the graphics community and the, in the vision science community. Just to show off a different example, here's another way you could do that. I mostly included this because it has a hologram, and holograms are cool. Uh, this is, you know, we have lasers in our lab now, which I enjoy. Um, and so this is a hologram that's basically placed at the, uh, at the focal length of a, of a concave mirror. So instead of having a convex lens looking at a screen, you have a, a see-through screen with a concave mirror behind it, like a makeup mirror. And now you can deflect that screen through, very few, uh, through just a few millimeters and get, you know, completely change the, the depth. Um, so let me, let me change gears now. So that's one theme of the research we've been tackling in my lab is sort of focus adjustable displays. I think it's really important. I think it's important to solve them with a wide field of view and some of the other, without giving up some of the other constraints that we've discussed. The other one, and you heard this alluded to, was foveated rendering. So I'll go into a little bit more detail than what you just heard. Um, foveated rendering, of course, is this idea that we're going to render the stuff that you're looking at in high detail and the stuff in the periphery at low detail. Um, and that's important because most VR pixels are peripheral. Let's take a really generous de definition of fovea and say the central 20 degrees of vision is our fovea. You know, remember there's probably some slop and inaccuracy and latency in our eye tracker. Um, if you look at an iPhone, the whole thing's in your fovea by that definition, right? If you look at a desktop monitor, there's about three quarters of it is, you know, is outside the fovea. So there's a limited upside. You could go to a lot of work to, to foveate that 27-inch that display and you'd only get a maximum of 4x improvement. Probably not worth it. But if you look at a modern HMD, um, like a Rift or a Vive, 96% uh, of those pixels are not in this central 20 degree of vision. So there's a huge opportunity here to increase performance um, and do more efficient, by doing more efficient peripheral rendering. And this is the work that you just, uh, you just heard. Let me uh, play the movie here. OK, so this is, this is not foveated. The little green reticle is an eye tracker. We're using the SMI Vive, uh, SMI equipped Vive. And so this is an ordinary, an ordinary image. Now, here's what happens. The first thing you would say is, well, let's just, um, let's just draw big pixels, right? Let's draw low resolution in the periphery, high resolution inset, and somehow you know, gimbal that around so it servos to your eye. Um, and this is what happens if you do that. Um, it's a little subtle on this screen, and so I, I have an exact, but believe, it's not subtle in, in VR. I'll show you what it looks like in VR by exaggerating the effect on this screen. Where you're looking looks fine, but everything else aliases, right? All those high frequencies alias, you know, awfully, and you have, um, you have this terrible, terrible flickering problem in the periphery. And so then the next thing you would say is, well, let me blur those out. I'll pre-blur the, the peripheral vision somehow, or some, I'll, somehow I'll generate you know, content in the, peripheral, uh, in the periphery that doesn't have those high frequencies. And I'll, I'll, then when I alias them, it'll, it'll, look, it'll, it'll be OK. And actually, that, that looks good on this screen. Um, in practice, it doesn't look very good in VR. It gives you a sense of tunnel vision. It's like your peripheral vision can't lat doesn't have any of the high frequencies it latches onto. I, I think understanding why this is the case is, is something you know for, for this community. But but um but it looks terrible, um, and you get this you almost feel drunk, right? I mean you know uh, without any of the pleasant side effects. And so here's here's um, here's what we came up. with. This is what was alluded to. The surprising and interesting result out of this out of this um, paper is that a very simple contrast preservation step after the fact actually makes this problem a lot better. So in other words, we take the, the, the highly detailed image, we blur it, and then we actually just run a simple like contrast enhance filter right out of Instagram or Photoshop, and we, but we overdo it. We turn it up to 11. We have, you can see there's terrible ringing. If you look at a place that's sort of away from the fovea, where's my mouse? Um, you can see there's all kinds of ringing and, and sort of haloing artifacts further away from the fovea. But um, in practice, this looks a lot better. In fact, it looks so much better that you can get away with like three, two to three times fewer pixel shades, two to three times fewer pixel computation. So it's, it saves us a factor of three just by doing this, this one silly trick of, of, adding, um, of adding extra artificial contrast. It's as if we're hallucinating features that aren't really there. Um, that's really interesting. And that's a direction that we've been pursuing. Um, but of course, there's so much more to peripheral vision <clears throat> As was just mentioned by Stefano, uh, then, then, then you know the drop, the simple drops in acuity, right? You know, we know that we have low sensitivity to color. We know we have low sensitivity to high spatial frequencies. We know that crowding plays a major role, um, and we know that we ha are highly sensitive to flicker and motion. So temporal stability and illusory motion that you might get from aliasing, these are a big deal. And there's this, you know, fascinating, you know, gestalt kind of effects. 
uh, things like faces. Um, as a fun trick, we tried the color one. There's not much win in this, right? It's a factor of three at most, you know, to go from three colors to grayscale. But it, it works incredibly well. If you ever have a, an eye tracking vibe or, or get the demo from us, turn on the color mode and, and you, it looks, you perceive it in full color, you look it up and actually, you know, 70% of the screen is in grayscale and you never, you never knew. It's astonishing how well it works. You can imagine doing other things. You can, in this case, we're foveating, you know, or alt we're alternating between uh, odd and even frames are alternating sort of a, a foveation that is biased either horizontally or vertically. It saves work that way. Um, and of course, <clears throat> there is this interesting work from uh, Ruth Rosenholtz's lab and Simoncelli's lab and all, all of this work on, you know, the effects of crowding and, uh, you know, th this, I, I find this super inspiring. Like, it really raises this idea that we could do dramatically less um, work in the peripheral uh, for, for generating the periphery, because we don't even have to get it right, right? We, can, we just have to get the statistics right, is what this sort of implies. Um, but we have to do so in a temporally stable way, and I think that's what's really tricky. So we're very inspired by this. We'd like to kind of continue to work on this theme. So I'll close. You know, this is really a plea for help. Um, you know, I think, I think that's a, a recurring theme. If, if you haven't picked that up, you know, you've got three big, you know, three, three companies up here saying, you know, we could use, we're, we're hiring vision scientists. Um, we need to understand the nature and quality of retinal defocus blur. The light field is a discretization of retinal defocus blur, that verifocal thing, we're just going to simulate it, we're going to do some sort of computational simulation. We need to understand, you know, how good does it have to be? What, what quality does it have to have? What is driving accommodation? And that, that of course, is very active work by some of the people in, in this room. Um, latency, I didn't talk too much about, but there's this interesting trade-off between the kind of uh, strobing and flicker and uh, that you get if you just flash the screen briefly for a little bit. Uh, that helps avoid retinal motion blur, um, but of course it decreases your brightness because now your screen's not on very long. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, strobing in the periphery can be very annoying. Uh, psychotic suppression, implicit in this discussion of foveated rendering is that after the eye moves, the boom, you know, the, the, the eye saccades over here, all of a sudden, I need to show the correct image here, but there has to be some amount of time before I can do that, right? Because it's going to take me a while to figure out where the saccade is going. Um, even if I try to predict it, I won't be perfect. And so how long after the saccade lands do we have until the image has to be correct? That answer is not, an that question is not answered in the vision science literature. There are very related questions that are answered, but this is an example like sort of taking what's already known, which is vast, and operationalizing it into the design of displays is a really interesting, really pressing problem. And finally, as I alluded to, Foveation is incredibly important. You know, there's 96% of the, of the pixels are peripheral. We'd really like to exploit that um, and, and get a, you know, a 20x improvement or whatever the number is uh, in, our, in our rendering or a 20x decrease in the battery, <laughs> in the size of the battery we have to lug around or whatever. Um, uh, but there's, it's such a complicated and, and fruitful area. And I think there's a lot of things we can do beyond just turning down the resolution and blurring a little bit. So. With that all in, uh, thanks for listening. We have some time for questions for David specifically while we set up for the panel. <coughs> if there's no question, in the meantime, I'll ask. Oh, there's a question. Oh. We got a question. Yeah, um, I've got a paper that talks about how long it takes, how long, how quickly after you, uh, the eyes land, you need to update a uh, foveated display. And we found that if you got it done within 60 milliseconds afterwards, you didn't increase the uh, perception of uh, blur because you've got the blur that's gonna be in the fovea, or sorry, in the periphery of the uh, N minus one fixation, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, that's there until you update it, mm -hmm. if you're doing it on a saccade by saccade basis. So, yeah. Great, thanks, yeah, I'd love to talk afterwards. We found that, um, another interesting thing we found is that it depends a lot on the style of foveation. So if you're foveating to big, chunky, high frequency pixels, it's different than if you're foveating to blur. You know, and so, so I think that's, that's one of the things that we found. And, and our numbers were closer to 40 milliseconds, but I think that's congruent. You know, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to talk about that. Well, we have it's going to be a question. challenge. Yeah, I have a question, like a 
the more hardware side, do you guys have any do you guys have any plan to support Linux? Your yeah, your 3D Vision kit doesn't provide any driver for the Linux. Do you have any plan for that? <laughs> right. So the question is, does our 3D Vision kit, which is used by vision scientists, uh, is it ever going to support Linux? Uh, probably not. Uh, but I, I'm not I'm not at all the person to ask. But I, I know who is. I know the people to ask. So if you send me mail, I can I can route it. I mean I I mean it's just. I, I don't know how actively that product is being developed, right? It's, it's pretty niche at this point. So that, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that there's a reason for that. For that. Uh, send me mail afterwards. I mean, I at least know the people who, who do that. The early versions used to support it. I knew that. <laughs>